you know, when you look at Kansas City basketball, it, it's like being in a fraternity, you know, because the brothers, you know, basketball players, we, we come together and, and we, we talk about it, we, we brag about it, um, we compete. We, we took pride in our school. There's always been a great passion from my point of view where your high school means something. To put on those colors on Friday night and to have the cheerleaders put a little thing on your locker the day of the game and to feel that sense of school and the pride that goes with that. I just really felt like the 90s was, and when we put the cameras on them, I, I, I felt like they went to another level. Maybe that's just me, but uh, there was just a lot going on. We had some tremendous coaches, some tremendous athletes, and there was just a lot of focus on basketball. I think it was just a great time. You talk about the Peeler era that ended in 88 through the Jerron Rush era that ended in 98. You know, that has to be probably the best 10 years of basketball in, in this area. And we were able to take fans inside those gyms, you know, over at Wyandotte or Schlegel or the Interscholastic League Fieldhouse. It's a big deal for kids. It's a big deal for parents. It's a big deal for grandparents. It's coaches, it's teachers, it's principals, it's the athletic directors. Everybody is in on every single game. In the city, you, you, you're playing for something. You're playing for honor. You're playing for, you know, street cred. You, you're playing. You know, all that cute ball, we leave it out there. We're trying to deal with Blue. Forget it. The dish gets it back. Oh, oh, what a play by Crudo. You can smell the rubber on the floor with that flurry of activity. Kansas City, more than a lot of places, has a deep pride for things that are Kansas City. It's parochial in, in some ways, and I think the high school sports can be kind of the embodiment of that. Sports in general is a big deal, particularly for this city. There's a state line that divided us forever. Uh, that's the first thing I noticed was that, oh, Kansans hate Missourians. People in Missouri don't want to live in Kansas and make fun of Kansas. People in Kansas don't want to live in Missouri. And I think that sports was one of the rare things that unified the entire community. You know, sports have always played a prevalent role in our society. It, it fuels communities and it brings communities together unlike, I don't know the other thing, maybe music, but I think sports is still at the forefront of that. And, and so when you start to talk about high school sports, it takes on an even greater level, particularly during that era at the height of the Interscholastic League, when the Interscholastic League was really the Interscholastic League. Come on inside. This is the only game in town tonight. Welcome to the Fieldhouse. The Interscholastic League is on display tonight, and it's next on the high school game of the week. People don't realize back in that day, in the 80s, the I.L. was 12 schools deep. So you had Van Horn, Metro Tech, Southeast. You had all these schools for sale. You played against night in and night out when the I.L. Fieldhouse was the mecca of Kansas City basketball. And going to the Interscholastic Fieldhouse at that time, the place was rocking. Wall to wall, pretty much, on the folks here tonight. Oh my God, man. Best popcorn in the city, man. When I tell you the IL had the best popcorn, so, and it had to be because you had to have your popcorn ready. Oh my goodness. A lot of districts have great athletic complexes now. Blue Valley, North Kansas City is up at Staley High, but there's nothing quite like that kind of more traditional classic gym where you knew so many greats played at, where you could see so much go on, and frankly, where you're in the core of the community. It was just us, you know, um, those, Shawnee Missions and Olathe's and Park Hills, they, they couldn't compete. So you say, oh, I can't wait to become a senior. I can't wait to get on the varsity team in the packed houses. You know, the crowd, how that cadence, you know, who makes your body ache, who makes your body ache, kind of went with every school, Westport, Van Horn, Southeast, pregame. 
you know, you, you hear the, the uh, Emmanuel you like, oh, yeah, 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 coming up the steps. We had this thing full, sold out. People couldn't get in. We were downstairs doing our pregame with the coach and heard the bleachers coming out from the side. You, you hear those things coming, you know it's gonna be a battle, you know it's gonna be a game. And you had these teams that had really good players and really good coaches from Willie Bowie to Bill Madison to Jack Bush at Central, to all these guys had grown up around Kansas City basketball and they were bringing it to the kids. It was a really good league. Uh, Central uh, under coach Jack Bush had just unbelievable players. Coach against Derek Hood, uh, Michael Coleman. Quentin Day and Ramon Fletcher at Paseo or, or Travis Relaford when he started off at Central. You know, like his first game in the Isle Field, I said, the freshman, that dude had 43. They just had so many players on and on. And, and uh, so everywhere you went, you saw a good player in the Isle. There was a feeling like you didn't really make it in Kansas City unless you did it at the Fieldhouse. It was, I think, the premier place to play in high school basketball in Kansas City. I, I never understood when they say Kansas City, the majority of the U.S. thinks think of Missouri. Kansas City, to me, as a native, is Kansas. And there goes Victor Williams. Growing up in KCK is, is, it was a blessing, good, uh, but definitely a hard struggle. It was real, it was real. Um, Wyandotte County uh, taught us a lot of lessons. Fun, exciting, tough, tough. It was also, you know, learning experiences for those that wanted to make it out at KCK. You know, to be able to come back and do something for KCK, let me say it like that. We grew up, we battled, and I really like, even when I went off to college, I think when I got to college, I, it was nothing I didn't face already. But it kept you humble, kept you grounded. Um, so it was a really good experience and wouldn't change anything for the world. It was tough, man. Uh, when you just think about the full nature of Kansas City, Kansas, the stigma, but there's also a lot of love for, for sports. I think when we, th when we talk about Kansas City basketball, too often we're talking about Kansas City, Missouri. But in Wyandotte County, they celebrate basketball. Competition in the KCK League was different level. Kind of took it for granted. You just thought that was the norm everywhere. And it was only after I started covering basketball in other parts of the city that I realized that what was taking place in, like I said, the KCK League was very, very strong. I don't know, it was just a basketball haven in the Wyandotte County area and those junior colleges at the time. Best games I, I would ever go to. Wyandotte Schlegel. Oh my gosh. Got it back. The pump fake by Campbell. Oh, have mercy. He's not playing like a sophomore. That's an excellent pump fake. Wyandotte, you had uh, Nate and Victor Williams, Schlegel, you had Malcolm Campbell and Antoine Tisby, and you had Earl Watson at Washington. Watson for three. Earl Watson, a big three. Yeah, I covered Earl, and I, I'm really proud of what Earl became. At least for a time, if he still does, and he held the record for most games started in the history of UCLA. But he's just a winner, and so he just gets stuff done. So I'm gonna go get 15 rebounds if I have to. I might block some shots, I'm gonna get some steals. Washington, one dot at Washington on Metro Sports. Normally Earl talks stuff when he play, but this, this particular game, he wasn't talking stuff. Like, I, I hadn't seen this before ever in my life. He comes down off a break. Do a fake pass behind his back, and then just do a no-look pass just like this to Ramada Martin. He blew it. He blew the layup. And Earl just walked over to him and said, man, don't worry about it. We still got a game to play. I think we ended up losing that game by like two or three points. It was always a close game. I didn't care where you went. I think, I think growing up in Wyandotte County, you know, you couldn't tell nobody how good you were. It was something you had to prove. I, I, got a, I have a son right now, 14, and I just wish that he could have grown up like just playing in that competition. Like, it was tough. You know, it's, it's that extra level when they played each other that they would go to. You know, they wanted to go at it, and it, it was just special. And uh, to do it in a historic venue like Wyandotte High School was awesome. You walk into some gyms, like, ah, you know, they probably do school plays in here, 
probably play some volleyball in here, and they may do that at Why Not as well. But when you walk into the gym at Why Not, it says basketball. To this day, I get nervous and I get goosebumps walking in the gym because I know the tradition and I know the history that it came from Wyandotte High School. So the pride that it took to play at Wyandotte was big for us. I loved it, walking into Wyandotte and you just felt almost like Fenway Park on the high school you know, basketball level. If you go to Wyandotte today, it's the same as it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You come to Slago, you're like, oh, they got new bleachers, they got new this. Wyandotte is Wyandotte. If I'm not mistaken, Wyandotte High still have the most state basketball championships in the U.S. If you walk in Wyandotte's gym, you seeing all these state championship trophies. I think, you know, 98 was the last state championship we won, which made 20. My high school coach, Wayne Van Dyne, did a really good job uh, when he got there of making us all understand the history of Wyandotte. People would not understand today how, how that meant for their school, their tradition, uh, their neighborhoods, and things like that. That is a uh, just a rock when you talk about Walt Bloom and the Wyandotte basketball program. So I don't have the history with all the gyms in Philadelphia and New York City and places like that, but for just purely a look to a high school basketball gym, Wyandotte High School. And welcome to Wyandotte High School as we tip it off on the high school game of the week. We like to call this place the pit and uh, it really lives up to his name. The pit, man, it's the pit. Like he was, literally you felt like you were fighting for your life. It's like, yo, we gotta do everything we gotta do to get up out of here. Here we go from Wyandotte High School. It just reeks and drips of basketball. There's no question about it. I mean, it, it, was, it was definitely the six men. I mean, you know, if you would look down on the team and you would see people just kind of looking around the gymnasium in amazement. I'm sure we <laughs> went against a couple fire codes when, when I played because guys was hanging out the bathrooms. The, the windows was right there. They would knock the windows out and the, the doors were all open and they would park all the way up to the door. The pit was crazy. You would go there, and we we on we battling. You got the everybody on the sideline talking. Shit. This is crazy. You need security to get off the bus and back to the bus. It was real. But my dad's telling me the story. He's like, "This is not the place to get kicked out of." Because a long time ago, your brother did. Guy started hitting him from behind or something, so he turned around through an elbow. So he got in trouble, they called T on him. He gets thrown at the game and he walks out and he gave him the double fingers. And people up above were throwing stuff at him. So you imagine me as a player, I hear this, I didn't see it, I was a baby. And he's like, but just know there's gonna be people up above this basket in the second half trying to mess your, you know, your rhythm up. Hot, sweating, my fans was just right there. So like, I just remember like, pushing the ball up the right wing and they like right there. Like, you know, and whoever it is out on the floor, betting on the games, talking trash. Like that gym and that crowd is just like, it gives you goosebumps still to the day. Don't take anything away from the IL Fieldhouse on the Missouri side. Two classic gyms, absolutely love both of them. Two great atmospheres. Crowds that come to those gyms are fantastic. But the gym at Wyandotte High School, for me, is the best place to watch a high school basketball. It, depending on how old you were, and you talked about Kansas City hoops, now you would bring up some guys uh, back KCK in the in the 70s, right? Um, and they, they had some squads, and they had some players that played in the league. But most people around my age, and maybe 10 years older and 10 years younger, if you list, if they listed best players in KC history, Peeler's going to be on that list. He was the first McDonald's All-American in Kansas City in 1988, and that just for that to happen, and that was just a real milestone for him, the city, for Paseo, a great program, and it helped put Kansas City a little bit on the basketball map. I Tell you, to make it simple and sweet, after Anthony's freshman year, uh, it was great to wake up in the morning knowing that I had Anthony Peeler for another three years. He seems to make all the rest of the ball players on the team with him play better. And he's been great for the past four years for Purcell High School basketball program. There's, there's not one player in my era, a little before me or after me, that's in the same category as Anthony Peeler. I mean, there just wasn't. I mean, he was just that good. Best high school player out of Kansas City ever. 
when AP came along, he, he told me when he was 14 that, that he was going pro. He's one of the guys that really uh, made Kansas City basketball start taking off. Well, to tell you the truth, Peter's the last of the OGs. That's what makes it so smooth. He pretty much was just toying with you. I uh, was really impressed with how he could just do everything. He was a great shooter, great passer, great uh, rebounder. He could shoot it, he could drive by you, he could jump over you. I think Jack Bush even said once he's got eyes in the back of his head. Very smart, very intelligent. Also has some ups. <laughs> you know, people talk, talked about his, his jumper more than his dunking ability, but he, he could get up as well. Uh, he was a senior, and we had a lot of seniors, and we were tough-minded kids, and we were we were not going to start on a box and one. I said, we're, he's just like us. He puts his jock on the same way. We're going to stop him, get physical. With those Italians, we were going to get really physical. The first time out, I think it was eight to nothing. I said, okay, he doesn't put his jock on the same way we do. We're going to we're going to the box and one. He just could turn it on like. Not many guys have ever seen. And my dad wouldn't give anybody credit. He's like, this dude is for real. He's like, I'm giving this guy credit. There have been a lot of great ball players at Purcell High School, but Anthony Peeler is by far the first complete basketball player. Bud Lathrop, 40th season. Over 800 wins. He got his 800 this season, Doug. That's unbelievable. And he brings another team in here. He's had some great ones over the years. State championship titles. He's made those runs before. In fact, we saw Javon Crudup in the house. And I remember a great game he played here back in 1990 against Lee Summit. The, well, the 89-90 Raytown South team was Javon Crudup putting that team on his broad shoulders and... That, that physique and, and that attitude that I'm not going to let this team lose. I'm going to carry this team, and um, it sure worked. I mean, they, they went on and had just a kind of a, a fairy tale kind of season, and it didn't look like it was headed that way. The Raytown South tradition goes on and on and on. It started with the arrival of head coach Bud Lathrop back in 1958. Lathrop, one of the best programs in Kansas City history, uh, were always good and they expected to win. He just absolutely hated losing and probably more, more hated the losing part than actually enjoying the winning part. Number one, uh, you could tell how much he cared. Uh, you could see it in his eyes, you could see it when he spoke to players. And I think once people know you care, I think it's really easy to lead them. He means a lot, you know, he gives us guidance and on anything we want to know, you know. And no matter if it's basketball or life, he always comes through for us. You know, Bud Latham was one of those guys that didn't mind hopping in this Lincoln Continental with his white dog riding all the way down here to pick up players. You know, Bud is right there you know, supporting that, that kid no matter what, then, then ride through Swole Park and, and drop him back off. You know, Bud, Bud was a good man. He was a good man. A fantastic coach. He had a way about him. He, uh, and, that, and that voice of his just, you know, resonated to, to players, fans, media, everybody. You're the five man. We've reversed the ball. Are you going to go over there and get open or are you going to stand behind him? and say, dear mom, there's a guy in front of me. Well, Lordy Betsy, what do you think there's going to be? He was, uh, he was a force of nature. He really was, to watch him coach. So he was a master at, at, at devising strategy. And then when you add to it, getting some pretty good players, that, that, that's, that's how you win 900 games. Bub was special. And what he did, and especially what he did that year at 89-90, has to be his best coaching job. He had some great players on those other championship teams, but to do what he you know, led to pull that off was, uh, it was incredible. Javon Crudup, Raytown South High School, class of 1990. Going into the senior year, I'm like, we're, we're gonna win state. I, I wasn't even concerned. You know, we're loaded, we have the experience. And then that, by that time, you know, Chris and I have been varsity three years going into our senior year. So the experience and the other guys coming up and, you know, through the JV system, um, and obviously learning the same set, same system or everything else. 
I had no doubt that we were going to win state. <laughs> they were, they were, they were the best team in the state of Missouri, if not the Midwest. Inside the crew, six foot turnaround. There was so much hype around Raytown South going into the 89-90 season. This is a magical season because everyone, they were pegged from the beginning. Everyone knew they were going to just steamroll people. Probably one of the first teams at Kansas City that played above the rim. And we hadn't seen that a lot in Kansas City. I mean, we were ranked number three in the United States in the USA Today poll, and none of that would have been possible without my team. I had great teammates. I mean, you know, you got Jesse Battles. He did the little things. He sacrificed a lot. We called him, we called him kind of the junkyard dog. That was Scott Fiddler. Wasn't a flash, he quad type, but he hurt you. He hurt you, he was a slasher, he cut. Then obviously um, we had Derek Cofield, you know, he was another sniper, I mean, he was a bomber. You know, we, we had two, you know, that's rare, we had two. And for the Cardinals at center, a 6'9", senior number 40, Javon Cruda. Uh, Javon Cruda, one of the strongest high school players I have ever seen. Just power. Javon was just a monster. I mean, Javon was 6'9". He was chiseled. He probably weighed 230. He looked like a man in high school. Basketball, you played it. You learned it, but you didn't really lift weights. Javon looked like he had lifted weights for, for his whole 18 years. One of the most physically intimidating, dominating players I have ever seen. I just want to inflict pain and punishment on people. I hear people talk about people taking their hearts and all this. I play to take your soul. I want your soul. Play angry. I mean, Crudup was a nice guy, but he, on the court, he had sort of that Darth Vader type persona. Well, he had some, a, some touch around the rim and a great basketball mentality. I mean, he understood the game really well for a young player. Uh, that was far from a one-man team, but he was clearly the best player on, the, on that team. Chris Lindley, talented, talented player. I mean, Chris was a freak athlete for his body. Um, perfect compliment to Javon Crudo. He was just dominant. Limitless. I think he was an NBA first round draft pick. The dude was 6'9", he was before his time. Back then, if you were big, you were just a post player. We would probably call him a two guard today. I mean, he had handles, he could put it on the floor. He could really do everything. He had committed to the University of Kansas. Crudup was going to Missouri. I mean, I think Chris would have shot 75% from the field, averaged 20 and 10, and been a lottery pick. I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a different type of player. You know, when Javon and Chris were playing, though, I don't know how you match up with them. Unbeatable uh, one-two combo. Even the guys that played in the 70s, they tell me, you guys were the best team to ever play at Raytown South. You know, it coming from these guys. These guys are state champions, too. And one of those teams only had one loss. So there was tons of hype. It was like, how are these guys going to maybe even, you know, can they possibly mess this up? KU was able to get a high percentage of the best player in Kansas City. Greg Gurley was that guy. Uh, Patrick Ritchie was that guy from Lee Summit. Chris Lindley was that guy. Typically, those guys go to every home game at KU. They just go to every game. They, they get a good seat. Coach puts them right behind the bench. You know, you feel like you're part of it. You know that's going to be you next year. And that was one of the games that Chris didn't go to. They played Winthrop on a Saturday night, and he didn't go. And instead, went to hang out on the train tracks. And I don't really think he knew all the kids that well that he was with that night. And they do train jumping, which he'd never done. I'll never forget the phone rang and it was Coach. And I'm like, what's up, Coach? You know, we just talking. He said, have you seen Chris? I said, I hadn't seen him. I hadn't talked to him. And so um, that was pretty much the end of that, you know, conversation, whatever. Then like about, I would say 1, 1 1.30, maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from one of, uh, one, of my, one of my teammates' fathers saying that he had a, he was an accident, you know, a train accident. So I'm like, train accident? What do you, what do you mean a train accident? You know, usually you hear a car accident or something like that. You know, we all went, we went down there and it was, man, I, I couldn't believe it. 
Couldn't believe it. January 6th. 1990, I'll never forget that day. I was working at Channel 9 the next day and our assignment manager waited for me when I walked to the door. Hey, good morning. Chris Lindley cut off his foot last time. I'm like, no, he did not. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. And he handed me a videotape. Chris Lindley is in stable but serious condition tonight at Truman Medical Center. Today's practice was closed to the media, but Coach Lathrop said a counselor was scheduled to talk to the team. He also said they'll be there for Chris when he needs them. I'll make contact with them, and I think our players, you know, they will continue to support Chris. And When uh, he signed with us, I told him that uh, he's signing a scholarship for life with Roy Williams, and uh, uh, that young man's going to have his education paid for. My dad came and woke me up early in the morning and, and told me what happened. I was devastated because I was... I loved Chris. The wave that the Chris Lindley injury sent through the city, so if you watch a standard 10 o'clock news, Chris Lindley, everybody in town was talking about it. I guess it really hadn't affect, you know, hit him in anything yet, but uh, his spirits are just like, uh, just like Chris normally is. And he is more to us than a basketball player. He's ours and we love him and we wouldn't care if he had never bounced the ball. He, he's, he's ours and we want him. We're glad we got him shocking it was saddening and uh, to me I just because a kid I, I had been covering and I thought you know such a good kid to see this happen to somebody who had a bright future who's gonna be going to Kansas to play basketball I, I, I couldn't believe it man it was just I couldn't believe it I'm like how does how does something like this happen I'm just happy to be alive and and, get, and have the opportunity to do a lot of things now it felt so good just to get out of the bed and I mean you can't understand just to, to be up walking again is, is something that feels so good. I mean, you just take it for granted so much. You know, I thought, you know, first of all, I felt for him and his family, and then I thought, you know, what is this gonna do to Raytown South basketball too? How are they gonna move forward with this? I don't know. I don't know if I would have been able to keep it together like Bud did, keep the team together like Bud did, keep a group of young kids playing as hard as they could. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know how something like this uh, will affect how, whether it'll make the kids play any harder, I, you know, I don't know. It was pretty much, this is what it is. You know, we're down Chris, you know, he's not gonna be playing anymore. We, we gotta get ourselves together, strap him up, and let's go to work. And I never forget, Coach had all of us at his house, you know, he's talking everything, and I was the last one to leave. I said, Coach, don't even sweat it. I said, I'll pick up the slack, and we're gonna win state. I said, don't even worry about it. He was looked at me, he was like, he said, you, you ready for this? I said, coach, we're not gonna lose the game. We're going to win this championship. This year's Cardinal team is 17 and 0, featuring the strength and power of Javon Crudup. He's headed for the University of Missouri. Glenn McDonald is in his sixth year as the head coach of the Lee Summit Tigers. This season, his Tigers are 17 and 1, led by the finesse and grace of Patrick Ritchie. He's headed for the University of Kansas. The area's two best teams collide next. Tonight's game, the Raytown South Cardinals versus the Lee Summit Tigers. Once the ball goes up in the air, and these are the two top teams, the focus was on those players. And we're looking at possibly the best game of the season in high school basketball. You're looking at a sold out Lee Summit High School. They're shoehorned in here tonight. We should have a good one. My mindset was just really totally different. You know, we're one, they're two. They're gonna stay two. Let's get this one underway from Lee Summit High School. The Crudup, his shot. What a shot by Javon Crudup. Ball stolen by Cofield. His race to the rack. Davis for three. Underway, second quarter, Richie out front against Aldridge. In the lane. That's what Patrick Richie is all about right there. And that's the end of the first half. Lee Summit has control of the first half. They we got down. I mean, that's just, we got down. Um, and man, it's like every time we make that run, they're coming, they're, they're, they're get a steal, or they'll hit another big shot. It was just like, they were they were hitting them all soon. They were they were hitting. Amazing as he gets it inside and fires and fouled by Richie. And look at this. And so 
coach be saying, we saying we're in a timeout, because this is what we're going to do. We just kept, kept chipping away, kept chipping away. He was like, they're going to pack him in, you know, and they packed him in. I mean, it, that ball was not getting in there. I mean, they packed three in the play. It was no way that ball was getting in there. They got it to him, and Crudup throws him off of Campbell. Well, what can you say for Crudup there? Look at three guys on him. How are you supposed to convert on this? So we need at least a couple of M1s. He's telling me we need some M1s or whatever. And, and I'm like, we're down nine, I ain't one. And, you know, two trading for three, that, that ain't gonna cut it. That's what I'm saying to myself, so. Number four, hold on to your chairs. Richie dishes to C.J. Davis. And I remember looking, it was 113 left. And I'm like, damn, we down nine points. It was funny because, you know, it's a timeout. They have a timeout, we have a time. Our coach is talking. And I can, I, I never thought, I still thought we were gonna win the game. I never, ever for once thought we were gonna lose that game. Bud Lathrop is not in the position he wanted to be. As we mentioned, he wanted to enter the fourth quarter with a little bit of lead so he could spread it out. But he now finds himself 10 points down. And, and Derek, I remember the ball was taken out. And he comes down, first possession, he's pushed, he comes up, and he just pulls up. Cofield's three. Bucket. None but net. I'm like, OK. The son got the ball. They turn it over out of bounds. So we get the ball back. He pulls up deeper. Field from way downtown. Oh, my goodness, 27 for Cofield. Hits it. I'm like, damn. Clock's ticking, you know, possession back and forth. So I'm like, OK, we're down three. Six seconds to play. So get it again. Derek gets it out. For some reason, they backed up off of him. Skelter environment here. Cofield's three. We're all, you know, coach said, we said, so we all hold up. I bring everybody in. I said, hey, game's over. I said, it's over now. They made the biggest mistake by going in overtime. Uh, we went up one, went to Alley Cat. I just finished them off. <laughs> just finished them off. And um, that was that was it. It was one of the best high school games I've ever played in. He overcome many things, and uh, we played at a great schedule. I mean, we played the best team in Oklahoma, the best team in Nebraska, the third or fourth ranked team in Florida, and a real great team in, from New York. And to win 31 games in basketball and play those kind of people is just a tribute to the kids. What was funny was we were having our run on the Missouri side. And I knew what Greg, Greg's team were, was doing on the Kansas side. You know, the neat thing about Greg Gurley is junior year and, you know, right down south was getting a lot of attention that year, but Shawnee Mission South was undefeated also. You would think they would get the same type of attention, you know, as far as what we got on the Missouri side. Man, they just, they had a hell of a team. You know, obviously they were undefeated. I mean, you, you don't go undefeated and you don't have a good team. It just don't happen. Greg Gurley, uh, graduated from Shawnee Mission South in 1991. You know, we were just kind of that team that kind of out fundamental you, if that's a word. You know, we would make the extra pass and do all the things that, that a, a well-coached team would do. Greg Gurley, he was a junior and who quit the time many people were saying was the best player to come out of the Shawnee Mission schools. Obviously, he got a scholarship to Kansas, and that tells you everything you need to know right there. Led his team to a lot of winning games uh, and really turned that program around, Shawnee Mission South. Greg was a hard nosed, tough player. You know, Greg was athletic. He just actually had some bounce to his game. Take it inside, he was very athletic. He just stood out. Man, he hit it from anywhere on you. I mean, you, you didn't get up on him, he was going to get you. And he was incredible across the state line, getting it done. Uh, Gurley was the leader of that team his junior year, and and they won this incredible game at state in the championship game. So it was a low-scoring game. Steve Woodbury hit a shot with 12 seconds on the clock, let's say, to put him up one, I believe. And I was guarding him. I was a terrible defender, and he got. An, I let him get an easy shot right in the middle of the lane. As you watch the tape, you're like, "What was I doing?" So then we had a timeout, and we didn't call it. 
And we kind of struggled to get the ball over half court. Some people in Wichita might say that we should have had a 10 second call, but if you put a stopwatch on it like we've done, it wasn't 10 seconds. Um, and we were kind of scrambled. And then right at the end, Kevin Rabbit dribbles kind of to the left side. I pop open at about half court, take a couple dribbles and just fire with probably three on the clock. Ball goes through and then I'm, it's a blur. We win our fan base. We had unbelievable fans. Ran, all of them pushed against the bleachers to get on the court that the bleachers spring loaded back into the wall. And so they go out on the court, tackle us, go crazy. You know, talk about a long time coming. That was the first state championship for a boys basketball team in Shawnee Mission since 1953. You know, it's, it's, it's just a cool moment. And we're very fortunate because my mom filmed it. Like back then games weren't on TV. There wasn't like a broadcast of the state championship. That's my mom, Carol Gurley's camera on her shoulder recording that. There could be another tape that exists, but luckily, we have that, you know? And so, yeah, you get chills when you watch it for sure. He hits that winning shot at, at just a couple seconds left to win the state championship. The crowd rushed the floor. We had unbelievable fans. I mean, we had, it was like an Allen Fieldhouse type atmosphere in White Auditorium in Emporia, Kansas. After a pep assembly to honor the state champions, these Shawnee Mission South students got to go home early. But everybody was talking about what happened Saturday night in Emporia. And then there, there was a guy that ran the high school athletic association named Nelson Hartman, who was just an old fuddy-duddy who didn't like our fans being loud. And they didn't award us the trophy. They said uh, because of unruly fans, we wouldn't get the trophy. It was a joke. By not getting the state championship trophy, the team is being denied the recognition that they earned on the court. If someone wins a state championship on a last second shot, sure the fans are going to be excited and they're running all over the court. But they tried to get back at the, the, fan, the uh, stands had collapsed so they couldn't get back in their seats. I just remember about it thousand people running out on the floor just just engulfed the whole floor and I think it was great school spirit that they all came out. I saw nothing uh, at all that, uh, other than excitement. I saw nothing unruly. I think that under the circumstances students were just happy and excited. They said we weren't going to get the trophy until there's a special meeting of whatever other old guy board wants to say we shouldn't get it. Eventually, two or three weeks later, they voted. Uh, luckily, they did the right thing. And, and uh, I think it was 1952 when the last Shawnee Mission School won, and ours was 91. So, you know, our community, our, my high school classmates, it was like a big deal. It was a huge deal. It was a, you know, it's a lifelong memory. You've covered sports in this town for a while. You've covered high school basketball for a while. If you had to make a ranking of your favorite high school game, what game do you think you'd put at number one? Well, the, the classic game was the 95 game at Municipal. It was historic. That building has seen a lot of great basketball, and that day, high school basketball, never better. It was a phenomenal game. Probably the best high school game I've ever seen. You know, two great players that were battling out for who was the best player in the city. I don't know about the East and West Coast, but I've been in the Midway all my life. I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. There's not another game that where you could tell me there was two future pros, double overtime, to go to state in front of 10,500 in a historic stadium where a Final Fours won. So yes, it's the, it's, the, it's the best high school game in Midwest history. Well, we made a vow uh, last year at the state. We um, we sort of disappointed ourselves, and so we made a vow that uh, we will return and make up for the way we played last year. If you know anything about basketball or care about the history of the coaches and the players that came through there, think about Jack Bush and his his career. Dad is a he's kind of a mixture of intensity and a real good guy. Being from the urban core, um, he cared about the young men and wanted young men to be a whole lot better than what he was during that time. He had such a great presence. It just, uh, you were in awe getting to coach against him. 
Jack Bush is a, he's an icon. He's just an icon in, in, in Kansas City, Missouri basketball. Whew. Man, that's hard for me. Uh, he changed my life, man. You know, um, coming from a single parent home, a lot of people don't realize the, the trauma of not having a father around. And I was always angry. I was very competitive, but I was always angry. Coach Bush was the first man ever to pull me to the side and say, hey man, you gotta get that, you know, under control. He's your best friend. He's everybody's best friend. Coach, there was never a time I felt uncomfortable talking to Coach Bush about anything. And he would be honest with me, upfront with me. The guy never missed a day of work. I think he missed one day of work through his whole time at Central. So he was always there. So that's what I think about a best friend. They're always there. So anybody that's never met him, just know if you were ever to walk up to him, you had a friend in that guy. I mean, he had, he had a phenomenal streak as far as not just winning games, but getting teams to the Final Four. Uh, it seemed like they were in the Final Four every year down there. Central was the big dogs. You know, they had the, 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 the records and the, the, the players, and they had the history, man. And still, to this day, I feel like they got the history. If you didn't go there, they were your rival. Even if they beat you every single time, they were still your rival because you wanted to beat Central High School. They were kind of the cornerstone of that league, and, you know, Jack is the reason why. Central is central. Actually, that's the perfect name for this because when you talk about basketball, it's the central location when you talk about Kansas City, Missouri basketball. And when we talk about central, I mean, you don't have to talk about this guy too much. People all over the country know who he is. He's headed for the University of Arkansas next season. Derek Hood was quiet, unassuming, but had, you know, talent, you know, coming out of his fingertips. It was the first time I saw Derek Hood play in person and off the opening tip, I think it was Tobias Harris got the ball and fired one from half court and I thought he just threw the ball out of bounds and Derek Hood went up out of nowhere, grabbed it and threw it down. I thought, that's different. break. This is Jones to Hood. Oh, I knew Derek was different at tryouts. Uh, <laughs> Derek came in Duncan as a freshman that time. And when I say Duncan, he wasn't barely grazing the rim. We do layup lines at Duncan. This boy was taking off leaning like Mike. Because when you went and watched uh, Central play, Derek Hood was flying out of the gym, alley oops left and right. Six seven, can run the floor like a like a deer. And then those other bigs would look at him and say, like, I just can't keep up with this dude all game long. So he would just run the bigs in the ground. You could tell how special that team was, and Jack Bush was a great coach too. And it wasn't just Derek Hood; they had a lot of guys on, on that team. We don't we didn't run from smoke. We were the smoke. It was Central, and then let's see who was going for second. That's how, that's how we was. And it was the Derek Hood show tonight seven dunks 25 points and on that note we'll go to break central has won it by 15 back with more after this we came in ranked i think we were ranked number one to start the season and then about four or five games into it raytown leaped us without I'm like, wait a minute, they're number one in the city I'm like no man so who's raytown like central is central in 94, uh, we won 17 games. We were like 17-10. Uh, good team, but not a great team. But we're playing in a fall league down at Guardian Angels Gym there off around by Westport. And just on their own, they were picking up full court man and pressing and trapping on their own. And they were just killing people. I thought, you know, this, you know, I don't know if this worked that well in an organized game, at, you know, at the high school level, but we well, sure done a pretty good job at it. But we started picking up momentum toward the end of the year. Uh, Teron was just a junior, and we had some sophomores playing. But you could see uh, how Teron was developing, where he was going to be a dominant player. Even though he's like 5'10", five, 5'11", five, but you could just see he was special. And I remember watching Lou play, and I'm thinking, I've never seen a point guard see the court as well as he did. Um, could shoot from deep, quicker than you think he is, way better handle than anybody ever probably gave him credit for. Teron is the fastest point guard I've ever seen. We played them, I, it was my first year at Liberty. Teron came across half court and shot it from the 10 foot volleyball serve, service line. And it was nothing but net. And the, one of my guards looked at me and I said, I got nothing. You're gonna have to pick him up earlier. You know, you, you just. And when you look at Lou's career from there, to Nebraska, to the NBA, and I had coach in the NBA, and all the people that he worked with along the way, incredible. Teron Lou was a was an unbelievable player, and that team was so well coached at Raytown. 
I, I could have started at Raytown because I didn't have any height. Piggly Wiggly starting lineups. Tyron Liu averages about 23 a game, uh, game Tyron does. Cortez Groves, Nooner, Weiss, and Saron Webb, their 5'10 post guy. <laughs> and they do it for Coach Mark Scanlon in his eighth season and what a program he has built here the last couple of seasons. He runs a great show over at Raytown. We had no post guy. We had five guards, so we ran a five out motion. We were just kind of pass and pick away, cut the basket. Uh, spacing was important. And basically, we, it, was, it was built on layups. Our guys drive to the basket, we're shooting threes. Word for the season, Coach Scanlon told us that he was going to start five guards, and we still. We were like, you know, that's just, that's unheard of, but it was something that he had the foresight to think about and put us in a style of play that made it fun and made people want to watch us play. And we started covering these guys, and it was my favorite team because all, it seemed like it was the six foot and under lead. Sarone Webb at 5'10", guarding the guys in the post. I mean, it was unlike any team I had ever seen. We were probably the most entertaining team to watch. And I still have people tell me that was the most, their favorite team, high school team around here. They had that killer instinct. If they had somebody down 15, they wouldn't be by 30. I mean, nothing was enough for them. I mean, they, they just wanted to destroy people. And it, it was fun to coach those guys. I, for me, I always had this perception about, I'm from the city, I'm from the hood, I'm from Central. How is this suburban school better than us? I know they ain't got the dogs we got. So that's when I started talking trash in the papers after every win and things like that. And, you know, I was kind of discrediting who they was playing. Like, who y'all playing? Winnetonka? Y'all playing these other schools? We down here battling against Fashan and Northeast and all these schools and East and Southeast. Man, it's like, who, who do they think they are? I mean, they ain't the only ones that can play ball in the city. It's like, we Central. And I think our guys uh, are realizing more and more that they can play with the best. And I think the better the competition, the better they play. And we are determined to win the state championship. This is not bragging, I'm just stating some facts. Yeah, we, we, you could see a building as a collision course. Here was gonna be two giants, powerhouses that were really emerging as probably the two teams it was gonna come down to to go to state. Who's the best? you know, put up a shut up. Jason Woodlock, who was with the start at the time, he basically said he knew it would come down between, you know, the Mighty Mouse versus the Land of the Giants. So I think most people who felt like Raytown was going to be one of those teams knew at some point they're going to have to play Central and it's probably going to be here in the quarterfinals. Well, I mean, we had a shoot around in the morning and I had friends call me the night before and they go, are we going to have a hard time getting the game? I go, no. I said, we're playing municipal. I said, it holds over 10,000 10, people. I said, there should be a, a, plenty of seats. I said, there'll be a good crowd. Well, it's funny because there was a game prior to that. So, you know, to get to stat, I think it was the women's. And it was one of those things where you you felt it was going to be big, but you just didn't know how big. And, and I'm a Christian. So my, my grandmother used to always tell me, hey, pray before every game, pray before every game. So I remember putting my hand on my knees and just saying a prayer, God, I'll just play that I play well. I want to win. I've been talking. And I actually told God this, God, I've been talking all this trash about right now. I want to win this game. I want to play well, but I want to win. Please don't let me foul. I remember that prayer and just sitting there. And we, we had our guys down in the locker room talking about it with the pregame, getting ready to, to, for the game of Central. And then the girls' game's over with, and we're coming out of the locker room, out of kind of a tunnel. And I remember hearing a roar, which you just don't hear in a high school game. And then we go back to the locker room, we get getting dressed, and we come out for warm-ups. I'm like, oh, this mug is packed. And then when I, when you hear the stories now, it's like people were really pushing to get in. I mean, it was a cold, wet day. It wasn't like it was nice and sunny, but there was people, grown-ups, pushing to get in to see that game. They got turned away. And it's a, it's a war zone. The windows had been broken at the front of Municipal Auditorium. There was police tape up. And I'm like, you're kidding me. There were policemen everywhere. I called Jack Harry again and said, Jack, you gotta get a live truck down here. This is unbelievable. But when I walked out of that locker room to, for warm-ups, I just remember like, this is about to be crazy. We have to win the game. We have to win the game. Welcome to the auditorium. We've been waiting on this one all season long. The Blue Jays of Raytown and Central's Blue Eagles. There isn't a seat to be had in here 
tonight. The capacity is about 10-5. That's exactly what we have. We may have some standing room somewhere, Duke. This is incredible. It was electricity from the time we tipped it off to the game's over with. It was just nonstop action. Well, no surprise that Central won the tip. Jefferson to Hood. I guess he settled things down. Jefferson with the bucket. Weiss the other way. Spanked by Hood. They lob it for Hood. All she wrote. Count it. That Raytown Central game was probably the fastest game we ever been through, man. Up and down. I don't think, like, like I believe the commentators even said, hey, we haven't even caught our breath yet. This has been a frantic first quarter of action. And there's Weiss for three, and he gets one down. And, and there's the size advantage for Central, but the quickness when they bring it on the floor from Raytown. It was just, it was that nature, that, that atmosphere that just pushed the adrenaline. We was, we was, <laughs> dude, that was fun. That was tiresome, but fun. It was difficult. Most teams we were stable to guard people that, that had a size advantage all year. But not only were they big, they were so athletic. Lob it inside, Jefferson. The quickness from Lou, pinned by Hood. We didn't play much zone that year. Maybe a couple games we ran a little zone. In that game we ran a little 1-3-1 one, one because it was it was hard to guard. I mean, yes, because one of the things that Central was able to do again that Raytown was able to do against other opponents was they could run up and down the floor. Well, our athletes or our players can run up and down. Derek can run up and down the floor all day. So The other way, oh. Jefferson! Coach Bush coming that first day of practice, and he told us, if we shoot a shot outside of that paint, we're going to ride the bench. We're going to sit the bench. To Ron Lou out high, let's fly a three. We're not worthy over here. You know, in the first half, there was a stretch where Teron Lou went nuts. I mean, you know, I, I want to say he had about 20 points in the first half. Great pass by Weiss. Count it for Lou. Go back, get some more handles here, Duke. Lou to the rack. Uh -oh, With the move. left. I think the only solution is to not let Lou catch it. There's the bounce pass and count it for Tate. And a great pass that time. Look at, look at this hustle by the two star players, Hood and Lou. Lou got a piece of it. Um, you think about how well um, Teron and D-Hood, for them to be the marquee players, and they both brought their A games and, and put on the show for the crowd. Personally, I played terrible. It was one of the worst games I probably played in my life. Most of the year, we played pretty much six kids, you know, seven kids. and. Uh, what happened was we ended up having two kids get in foul trouble and we actually had two guys get fouled out. Well, the lead has seesawed back and forth. Raytown has led most of the second half. This game has been tied nine times. I had just made two big free throws and it was a guy, I remember a guy like talking trash to me on the court, you go miss. And I shoot it and turn and look at him with my follow through up. And now this is what you dream about, going to the line in front of 10 grand at the auditorium. Nooner does it first, and now Weiss hits two. You know, like the game was iced and I had blocked the shot. 64-60, and... Raytown on top by four with 30 seconds left, under 30 left. Back at him, Nooner thought he got the block, but he picks up the foul and he's gone. And Nooner fouled out. Nooner didn't even foul me, and he fouled out. Look at the film. I go up, and I take one step to lay the ball up. He gets the ball clean. I told him this. He gets the ball clean, and they call a foul. Tell you what, that was a close, close call. Send me, me and him talk about it. He knows it wasn't a foul. He says it wasn't a foul. And actually, what was crazy about that, my free throw, I missed one and made one. My free throw is the one that cut it to three. Can't get the second. Loose ball. Central comes away and a foul on Raytown. Really, Lasasso couldn't do anything about that foul. He was on the floor reaching for the ball. And Kenny Moore just trying to get over the top of him fell over him. But it was a loose ball that was on the floor, people diving for it. And then I think Derek just picked that pull up and shot it. And we had like three seconds left, and I'm on the bench, I'm yelling, shoot it, Derek! And like I said, Derek couldn't shoot, especially from no three-point shot. 
Missing again. Jefferson free for the rebound. Now Hood for three. Oh, man! Derrick Hood has tied it up with a three! Well, it just... It, it just so happens there's only a three-point shot he hit, hit uh, in his career. I mean, that shot was huge, man. Everybody's going crazy. We got 10,500 people going crazy in, in, inside the arena. Then mayhem really broke out because, you know, Raytown brings the ball down. Twice the other way, time winding down. And the time has run out. We've got... Well, we got now what are we saying here? We got overtime. There was some crazy stuff that happened at the end of that game. Uh, they had to score wrong at the end of regulation. The scoreboard says a one-point win for Raytown, but now it's back to 64-64, so we have overtime. That's correct. The scorekeeper went to sleep. I think Hood hit the shot to tie it, and then it was our ball. We threw it in, and we're going. And, and our kid looked up on the scoreboard. and said, Brandon Weiss, who it was. And so he didn't push it. He didn't continue to push the ball down, like thinking he had to hurry up and score. And score. The game was really tied. But on the scoreboard, it showed us up one. So he kind of hesitated. So there were some people trying to figure out what, a lot of people are trying to figure out what's going on here. Well, you know, after about a couple of minutes, they figured out, OK, the game's actually tied. So you know, talk about drama. To Ron Lu with the Blue Jays on his back. Blocked away, we'll go to double overtime. We're begging for mercy here in the auditorium. Tied at 70, heading to the second overtime. It's beautiful. Because you gotta think double overtime. I mean, so yeah, even though Derek hit that three, we still had two more overtimes. They'll be talking about this game for weeks and months to come. Hood inside with a big slam. Mercy, his 33rd point of the ball game. No foul call. Be a foul there. Jefferson Powell lays it up and misses, but Jefferson tips it home. I tell you what, Teron Lou is just gassed. So that was one of the things that worked in our favor that we had a deep enough bench where we could where we could run bodies at them. If they had had me or someone like me or you, then we're able to go in and take some fouls and get a few rebounds, and they just got outmanned. Central with the steal, and they're going to move on to Columbia after winning one of the best games ever in the Kansas City area. Central has won it. You know, Lou had 30 points. Uh, he was exhausted at the end, and Derek, I think, had 33. And the two marquee players that everybody had, you know, knew how fantastic these guys were all year long in Kansas City. You know, they they showed up that night. It was like two heavyweight fighters going at it for you know 15 rounds of nonstop action. We were young. I don't think we realized until. We were out of college and like grown and realized like how much of an impact the game really had on people. I mean, I thank God every day, man. It's, it's, that was a true blessing for me to be a part of such a historic basketball event in Kansas City, a city that I have so much pride in. I, I'm so KC, I'm Gates, I'm Topsies, I'm, 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 I'm Go Chicken Go, I'm Prospect back in 95, I'm, I'm Swope Park. And, and for me, I'm Central Basketball. It was crushing to me, uh, that was, Nine years after I graduated, I still can't watch that game. I think anybody that witnessed that game was there will say that probably in Kansas City history, had, that had to be the best. For me, it was the, the best high school basketball game. There may not be another game like it. I mean, in, in, when you sit there and watch it, you, it's just, it was a phenomenal game. And I'm, even though we got beat in, I'm, I'm just glad I got to be a part of it. Hi everybody, I'm Duke Fry and welcome to Metro Sports Talk, the debut of our new channel, Metro Sports, here on Channel 30 on American Cable Vision. Glad you could join us tonight. First of all, I'm so old, you set the recorder, you set the VCR before you left the house. 
to come on um, so you can record everything from Metro Sports to the news to everything. We watched it. Parents watched it. Families watched it. Like you, you watched SportsCenter, but you also you always knew when Roundup was and Metro Sports. Uh, I remember going to Paseo High School and I'd be I was walking through the hallway with my camera and my tripod and uh, the kids were like, oh, hey, Metro Sports doing our game. Oh, like, you know, like we just, it gave you that extra energy that you needed. And it was like that at every school, whether it was, you know, Lather or Shawnee or uh, North of the River, whatever school it was, everybody just wanted to be on Metro Sports. Well, we started by broadcasting high school games and football and basketball back in the late 80s, really, when the company was called American Cable Vision. And over time, we just built up facilities, trucks, equipment. Uh, I was working for Don Fortune at KBZ and Radio. I had been there for three years. I also worked with Duke Fry a lot. And Duke came to me one day and he said, hey, these guys over at American Cable Vision have this idea. John Dennison and Neil Harwell, they have an idea for an all sports TV station just for Kansas City. And he said, hey, would you consider coming to work with us? I love the concept. It was so unique. We had the time and we had the resources and that nobody else had to throw to high school sports. But the initial concept was very exciting. We're, we're gonna have our own TV station. This is not Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 9, Channel 41. This is an exclusive sports channel just for Kansas City. And it was something that we wanted to get started as the grassroots, which finally led to Metro Sports being founded, where we really covered the marketplace. Welcome to the Lathrop Gymnasium, sold out prior to 5 p.m. this evening at Raytown. But we had a high school game of the week every Friday night where we would roll our truck out there and we would have, I don't know, seven, eight camera shoots and shoot it like it's an NBA game. And so when we showed up at your field or your gym, it was a big deal to have those cameras on and I, I felt like the players knew it and the coaches knew it. Anytime I'm in the game, I'm like, oh, if I dunk this, it's gonna be on TV later on and I'm gonna get to see it. Locked there by Good and George Good ahead of the field and will slam it home with the right hand. Get ahead to Morrison. Morrison driving, and it rejected by Good. That was the mecca of everything, because I know everybody else in the city gets to see it, because I know everybody's watching Metro Sports after the game. And welcome to the High School Roundup on Metro Sports. I'm your host, Brad Porter Sands. Okay, so High School Roundup, how it started is Chad Harberts and I am kind of kicked around this idea of, well, there's not really a sports center type show for high school sports. Just highlights and just high school, that's it. It's small seven action, Raytown South and center went right down to the wire. Once we got it kind of figured out, it was fantastic. And the feedback we got initially was, show's pretty good. Welcome to the Honda High School Roundup. It's a different crew for this third Friday. At its peak, we covered 150 high schools in our viewing area, both sides of the state line. And then when we really got rolling, it's like, this is, this is must watch TV. We have to watch this show every Friday night. Welcome to Abilene University in the ninth annual Hy-Vee Shootout presented by Metro Sports. Session the eighth Hy-Vee Shootout presented by Metro Sports. Game in the eleventh annual Hy-Vee Shootout. The seventh game in prime time in the twelfth annual Hy-Vee Shootout. Started off as a three-day event and then it kind of grew to a four-day event. Every team wanted to be in the Hy-Vee Shootout, and this was four days of nonstop boys and girls basketball. This was a showcase event to where you could see the best talent in the region. I saw a couple games on the calendar where we were gonna be playing Miege in the Hy-Vee shootout against Isaac Miles and some other guys that I had run into over the summer. And I was like, this is gonna be an opportunity for me to really kind of get my name out there and show people that maybe I'd quote unquote arrived. This ball game, Rockers done a good job defensively. T hand with the steal, look out below. Woo! Some athleticism too, huh? Tehan again feeling it. Oh my, he's burning the nets down, ladies and gentlemen, and laughing about it. To be a part of the hobby shootout was pretty fun, like you said. Isaac up the floor, he lost oh. Strozier. They're still trying to foul him. Oh, wow. He shoots a two and hits it. Oh. As a kid, you knew in the neighborhood, was, everybody was going to be watching you, so it was always fun seeing, staying in room only, basically. 
ahead to Miles, who has 20 in the ball game. Shake and bake to the hoop. Yes! Especially as a freshman, sophomore, playing as varsity starting on a good team and playing against some great players, and you knew it was going to be on TV on Metro Sports. Marcus Walker would score 20 as he's being introduced to the crowd here at the Maybe Arena. The thing I remember most about Javi's shootout is that we always played against me age. You know what I mean? I just got a kick and a thrill. If people watch me play, I'm like, like a showman. 56. Walker. just a killer. He said you had to be on your P's and Q's or he was going to drop 50 on you. So I seen it. So I was like, yeah, I always took pride. Like he can't have, he can have 30, but he can't have 50 on you. He was somebody that you could never let him get hot. By the way, he's the second leading scorer in Kansas City history, but he had 2,792 points. That's me. That's what I've been on. So like, I really just enjoyed the, the atmosphere, the amount of people that was coming to watch me. Like I thrived off that. I'm walking in the gym. It's Pack, capacity. Down by three, under a minute to go in your first quarter, and Dominic Johnson to the rack. I had to be the one. When it came to competition, I had to, I had to win. Driving back in. Oh, nice, nice pass, pass to Burton. Those are the games you want at being a high school player if you're playing in high V because you know everybody in the city is going to be there. A lot of times before we hit the floor, and I still do today, I look at the kids and say, this is why you come to me. If you see that crowd, you see what time you're playing, they're here to see you. They're not here to see me. They're not here to see the referees. They're here to see you. The later you played, uh, the more people were going to be there, the better matchup it was, and the, the more excitement there was. You know, everybody tells you, I, I took a sack lunch and watched eight games. People would come and watch eight games. It got so good that we were, we were pairing up D1 dudes in multiple games. Well, you'd look at the field, and it seemed like every year the teams that you wanted to see play each other were the teams that were actually playing each other. On behalf of uh, Dr. Dorena Sr. and myself, I would like to present this award to you. That being, of course, the school trophy that will stay here for one year and the individual trophy to Jerron Rush for the best high school basketball player in the Kansas City metro area. That means a lot. I mean, I hear it's the first sophomore to ever get it, and I'm glad for that. I mean, it means a lot that I elevated my game for everybody to see. How important was Jerron Rush and Kareem Rush in the development of metro sports? I'm trying to think of the, of the right adjective. It was powerful. Jerron walked into the room and you noticed him because there was this glow about him. During the Jerron Rush time, everybody else sort of took a back seat. It was all about Jerron. I mean, from when he was in eighth grade. Everybody in this area knows Jerron Rush was that dude. Jerron was a freak of nature, man. That, that kid, man. It, it was a show to come and watch Jerron and Pembroke Hill play. So it was, okay, game on with this, this kid is for real. Everybody was talking about it. And, you know, he, here he comes into Pembroke Hill. And you just didn't see guys who had legitimate NBA athleticism that young. And not just NBA athleticism, like upper end NBA athleticism. And, he can shoot, had good agility on defense, all while being 6'6", 6'7", 16 years old. Like, like nobody does that. He would intimidate you. He'd stare you down. You know, he was a bully. Jerron was a humble guy to come on the court. But at the end of the day, King Combs was on that court, and that was Jerron. And he could just play over the rim. He really played on the square. To this day, I don't think I've seen a high school kid, certainly not locally, who just dunked it so hard and just took it out on the rim. Like he, he was trying to tear that thing down. I don't know what happened with him. If, if he missed a couple layups one too many times and he just started dunking everything afterwards. He finished, he flushed it hard and he took pride in that. I mean, he was a monster. He was trying to dunk on you anytime he could. And this is at a time before the internet, before people really knew about junior high basketball. You know, Jerron would have had social media back in the day. He would have been a YouTube sensation. Two words, LeBron James. LeBron James. Literally the LeBron James of back then. You see everything you see LeBron doing? 
drunk, do all that. Was the most dominant high school basketball player I ever covered because he could beat you about five different ways. He was a guard in a big man's body, but he, man, he could run and do some unbelievable things. Jerron was the prototypical like NBA wing now. He every everything they want wings to do now, he was doing in '93. You know, that's crazy. To me, he's the best player that has ever played in the Kansas City area. Jerron, Jerron was that dude. <laughs> Rush hits the deck along with Erzin is scrapping for it inside. And now Kareem Rush ahead of the pack. Another oh spin move. Oh. Well, Kareem Rush has been overshadowed by his brother, but not in this move right here. That's good talent right there by Kareem Rush. Nice spin and handling the ball. Jerron Rush was a slasher, driver, and a dunker. Kareem could do all that. Kareem was a pure shooter. He was cool. He was, he was, he was ice cold. It's like, you know, Jerron was heavy metal, and Kareem was jazz. More laid back. Silky smooth, silky smooth. The first time I seen him, he was my favorite. It's effortless. Kareem reminded me a lot of Anthony Peeler, left-handed, but again, he was 6'8", 6'9". Kareem could shoot it deep. He was a sniper. That one and two dribble pull-up was just unguardable. Oh man, it's crazy. You, know, you might as well just run down the court, because it's going in. But he can also finish on a break. Kareem will boom on you too, though. Shot. Oh, please, you got him have mercy on that one. Kareem Rush has brought everyone to their feet here. Kareem was a better all-around player than Jerron. Jerron was just so physical, intimidating, but Kareem was a better player. You see why he played in the league, you know, for however long it was, because you never really, like, felt him on the court, but then he would have he would have 30. He could just shoot it. The skill level was really there, and then being a left, he made him different. Because when he wanted to take a game over, there wasn't a lot you are going to be able to do about it. It was so crazy because Jerron, everything he did was just so loud. He remembered everything he did, but then at the end of the game, you know, Jerron would have 35, but Kareem might have 28 too. I mean, growing up with each other, playing against each other in the backyard or in our room or things like that, uh, I just knew what he was capable of, and I was just grateful to have him, have him with me. Um, if the average highlight segment for each game was a minute to 90 seconds, Pembroke had to get two minutes. Pembroke Hill has bolted to 15-0 in a rush. Jerron and Kareem, the Raiders are ranked number one in the city. But Thursday night it was Sean Dunson with eight three-pointers to beat Bishop Miege in round one of the Aquinas tournament. This team that's really, really good. It's not a one-man team with a bunch of other parts of, of role players. Had another player named Sean Dunson that was really good. Uh, Rick Allison did a great job coaching them, and uh, they were a very special team. Just from outside, Dunson count the basket. He's fouled from three-point land. And not only could Sean Dunstan drop 50 on you, he's like a 5'6", five, 5'7", five, little guy. Like, he's not supposed to do that. Now you've got a couple of, you got really basically three kids who have a chance to be D1 players. It was just, it was fun to watch. I did not like coaching against them. I coached against them as freshman and sophomore year. I finally got smart and wised up after Cream came in and they were playing together. I said, I bet I, we need to get these guys off the schedule. But watching him and Kareem together at Pembroke Hill to have two high-level Division I talents play together. I mean, it was cool. They were like Showtime. They were like the Lakers. They were like that. Everybody wanted them in their tournament. It's like, it's, this, is, this doesn't happen very often to see these two guys at this level play together in high school sports. Uh, Scott Fleming, Deron Rush. Nathan Johnson. Victor Williams. Liberty High School. Wyandotte High School. Pembroke Hill. Went to Wyandotte High School, graduated in 1998. Class of 1998. Class of 1998. 98. 98. 98. Oh, ma'am, so my junior year, the year that we won the state championship, I mean, the city was just loaded. It had the Rush brothers. Jerron was like, wait a second, this is different. Like, I, I don't know what this is, right? This is new to me. Then it became, the 98, the Wyandotte team, the Liberty teams. I really enjoyed Victor Williams and Nate Johnson. Those dudes were dogs. I mean, they just got after you. Playing over right in the hands of Williams, and he is gone. 
but you also had a Liberty team that's going undefeated in 1998. They had Nick Robinson who went off to Stanford and a bunch of excellent players on that team for Coach Nussbaum. There was no team like that Liberty team with that, the, that 98 group because they had star talent. They were almost like a super team in high school in 1998. There is Mark Nussbaum in his fourth season here at Liberty High School, and what a run they are on, 27-0. and 0. I would put them as, as, as my best team, yes. I knew they were really good when they were freshmen. By the time they were seniors, they were really, really good. The Liberty team in 1998, not long after we had started Metro Sports, was a team that we really locked on to. Uh, but that team was just dominant. I, I, there was no team that I remember coming out of the Northland for sure uh, that, that had especially suburban Big 7 ball back in the day. The type of situation right now is the fact that when someone scouts us, they're not quite sure who to stop from game to game. I don't know if you knew this, but Liberty, I don't think, has ever won a state championship in anything for team sports. And so, yes, it would be nice to be the first to do that. Uh, but once again, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's kind of state title or bust at that point. Nick had signed at Stanford at that point, um, and he was he was obviously kind of the leader of our group. Um, but yeah, that summer we all played together. I don't really remember playing a bunch of AAU. It was just kind of playing with those guys um, and really just kind of going all in, getting ready for that for that uh, '98 season. Ahead to Stiegel. It's over, and Liberty is won it. They're 24 and 0 now. That team is, is remembered because they, they had such a special run. They were undefeated. Uh, but they, they dominated teams, but they also won games in that state semifinal and the final where they were close games. Uh, and they had to make plays late in the game, and they had to get stops. And The game I remember most from the Liberty State Championship season in 1998 was the playoff game at Lee Summit High School with a packed house. They were playing Raytown South. You know, the Raytown South game, man, talk about, you know, you have to be lucky uh, to win one. I don't think we could have been any luckier that game. Liberty's undefeated. Raytown South is outstanding like they always are. Coach Lathrop had outstanding players. You know, they had the perfect game plan. They executed it perfectly. They had us on our heels. Um, I mean, it literally, if you look at all the great upsets that have happened, it was that game. The fourth quarter begins. Is this a great environment or what? And let's see what Coach Lathrop elects to do here with the lead, 32-31 as we begin the fourth quarter. And they just had that kind of funky offense where they, you know, they, they called it alley cat. Uh, I still remember Bud Lathrop just yelling alley cat over and over. But, you know, they kind of hold the ball, make you chase them around. And, you know, once they got ahead um, and the game was low scoring and, um, you know, obviously the pressure just started to build on us, you know, because we were the favorite in, in the, to come out of the city. Buford between the defense! And Ray South, as I remember that game, was controlling a lot of the game throughout. In fact, they were, you know, were leading down the stretch. Like this, and there's hey! Aaron Bell! Count it! He'll go to the line! Yeah, so we called a timeout. Uh, they missed an, another free throw. Uh, I remember the ball getting passed up to Stiegel, who got to half court, called a timeout. And timeout wow. called by Liberty Woo! with 10.9 left. And the Cardinals up by one. And in the huddle, um, you know, catch Nussbaum do what we typically did in close situations was get the ball to Nick and let him create. Uh, problem was, Raytown South came out zone. I mean, they kind of messed us up, came out zone, ball got swung around to the left-hand side. 10.9 seconds left in the season, possibly, for one of these two teams. Inside, they get it to Ralph. Ralph and the ball bounced and it's, you know, they always say it's a game of inches. If you go back and, and look at that, it's crazy how Raytown South just barely missed, one of their players barely missed grabbing it. And Jacob Street, one of the good players, he was a young player at the time for Liberty, uh, got the ball as Liberty is down one, time running out. Inside, they get it to Ralph, Rowan is there, Robinson battles, now it's Jacob Street on the block! Yeah, the celebration was pandemonium. That's the one thing that everybody remembers is, uh, you know, all the fans and everyone, uh, you know, running out on the court. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's something I'll never forget. The sound of Jacob Street off the glass and Liberty wins it. Like, that is ingrained in my mind. That I remember most, I think that was the biggest shot of the season for them because it kept their season alive and it was from a player that wasn't one of their big-time guys. 
The community really bonded with our team. You know, I think looking back was because we were the only high school in town and we were the first team to ever win a state title uh, in Liberty. So everything was standing room only down the stretch. I know the fire marshal was called a few times up at the high school those last few games. So it was amazing going on on uh, the run that we did with, with all the fan support. You're the first person we can ask this to. Who wins, 98 Liberty or 98 Pembroke Hill? I would say 98 Pembroke Hill. We wanted to play Pembroke. Yeah, I mean they were they were obviously seen and got all the the attention. You know they were 2A, um, and we just wanted to come play with the big boys. I mean for me, I was kind of like I expected us to do you know down the neck we did it. Like I said, it was 2A, uh, but anybody who talked you know they didn't want to come see us anyway. You know they would play you know we'd go play at Ray South or play Truman and they'd be playing Lawson or Smithville or something like that. So I mean we dominated everybody who came to the gym. We were played to CMH wise, so all those guys that was on those other teams knew what it was. But they over there playing against the kids, man, that, you know, probably couldn't even make a YMCA team. You know, that's what I look at. I mean, they over there beating people by 40. It's like, oh, you never played anybody. Wait a minute. Yes, we did. <laughs> we played Bishop Age. We played uh, Leavenworth. We played Truman. Uh, whoever you put in front of us, we played and we beat them. They, I mean, obviously they were super talented, but we just thought again, you know, from a whole team perspective that, um, yeah, we, we would have liked to see them come up and play in the biggest class that was possible. Liberty was a great team, but at some point, Talent, talent can win, and I, that Pembroke team was talented. We had some outstanding players, and we were winning this, you know, as far as Kansas City. Liberty wins the state title in 98, and then Wyandotte would win the 5A. So we had like multiple state champions uh, out of the Kansas City area during that time. Victor Williams in transition. As a duo, I would rank us number one to me. We never played a one-on-one -on -one game against each other. We would never play two, we, you know, somebody could never pick us against each other. We was always kind of like, you know, uh, Batman and Batman. We would never let nobody say, you know what I mean, Batman and Robin. Nate and Vic, man, they, they're at the top. You know, when you talk about backcourts. They competed so hard and I mean, they just seemed to just feed off each other so well. And As long as we knew we had each other, we was gonna come to humiliate you. Why he's in the air because he was off balance going up for that shot. And he's ahead of the pack. Oh, oh man, that was Nathan Johnson with the little left hand thunder. Nate Johnson is one of the best players ever. Like he's, to me, he's a top 10 player ever in Kansas City history. A slashing type player, uh, could shoot the three really, really well. Nate might give you 30, Nate might give you 40, and they might give you 50. Like. Nate's just a score. There was no shot that he didn't have, there was no move that he didn't have, and he was a dog on both ends of the floor. He had a, a special talent that was just God-given. You could call at 4 o'clock, we playing at 4 Nate. Nate would show up at 3.45 and destroy everybody in the gym. You gonna get every bit of me. You come to see a killer, and you come to see a show, period. Shift from the last half. And then Wyandotte's getting the easy fast break layups instead of Schlegel. Oh, God! Not tonight! You can't do that tonight, Look at Nathan! <laughs> I was the guy that, hey, we playing at 4 Vic. I was there getting shots up at 225, getting the extra was up, and I was going to stay late. In the ball game. Victor Williams! Oh, my gosh, it's just a matter of time, baby. <laughs> Oh, Victor Williams, my ace. You're talking about a true competitor, a true leader. It was tough, he had, has led. He wasn't afraid to not only talk a little trash to the other team, but you know, he'd get in the face of the teammate. Victor Williams was a dog defensively, a dog. Like, I played against him in college, Oklahoma State. He was a dog on both ends of the floor. And still to this day, I still talk to him, tease him like, hey man, that one-two jumper. Vic could stop on the drop of a dime. He can go 100 miles an hour and stop. He's going to pull up with the free throw line and he's going to hit that too. And so Vic was kind of doing everything Chris Paul's doing now. There's no Vic without Nate. There's no Nate without Vic. That's how me and Vic mindset was. We were just different. Like, we, our games complemented each other, you know? Uh, I was the more fiery one that was going to get up in you and talk some stuff, and, and Nate was going to finish the deal, you know? To feel that love walking back in there. But they'd be like, whoa, you know, Legends, Wind Out Legends, the last state championship, 1998. You know, Nate and Vic, the duel, you know, it was a good feeling. 
Yeah, I think I think Wanda High School did a great job of throwing us a state championship ceremony. This school has been a great school all around this whole year, and they just just been great for us all year. Well, you know, I went to the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame when I first got the job uh, four years ago in Springfield, Massachusetts. And there's a little uh, section there on high school basketball, and there's a section actually on Wyandotte. Wyandotte had won the second most uh, state championships in the nation. And um, it was just so special to be a part to be a part of the tradition then, but even now it's so much more special to actually have our own mark, our own mark on it. For us to win that championship and we all get to celebrate it, we bring that plaque, those nets, that basketball back to Wyandotte with our picture behind it, I held back so many tears. Uh, this is the game ball, and we are bringing this back to Kansas City for the city of Kansas City and Wyandotte High School. Yeah! All right. Jefferson almost had the steal. Robinson from about 16. Got it. 42-41, Liberty. You know, again, um, I think, you know, maybe, you know, we mentioned it, but I think we're still the last undefeated team, you know, in the big class to win a state title. And there was just a lot of people in Kansas City that felt some pride with that. Um, and, and just as a whole, um, Liberty's a big basketball community, always has been. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where, um, you know, we're very prideful about it and feel, feel very fortunate that we were, you know, able to pull it off. And because I was a, such a, on a good a high school team and we had a lot of success, I was able to receive a lot of rewards for that. At that time, I mean, Jerron was just a different monster. Like, I mean, you know, I did receive the Denver Inter Award with him, but uh, I never for a second thought I was as good as him uh, because he was just he was just a different, different dude. I mean, I've covered World Series. I've covered Super Bowls. I've covered the Olympics. I've covered unbelievable events, right, over the years. The Jerron Rush event is something that sticks out in my mind even today. Yeah, some tears are shed tonight at Pembroke Hill High School is understandable. One of the finest prep players the area has ever seen is playing his final home game tonight. I'm referring to the McDonald's All-America player, Jerron Rush. For one, you know, you hear about it, and then you actually see it, man. You just like, you think about like all the stuff you've seen as a kid, from NBA players, like these are grown men. It was like uh, something out of a movie. You know, you can't you, you can't write anything better than that. Like I said, his final game. You've got this guy who's like reached mythological heights in terms of just how good he was. And what better ending could you have it for the way things kind of ended for him locally, playing around the city? I just remember. It just being just my last game in the city, I didn't think it was a big deal, but it was a packed gym. Uh, it was ridiculously packed. Playing against Smithville um, over at Hickman. Um, you know, so they, I remember Smithville was stalling most of the game. And then all of a sudden, fourth quarter, we broke out and had like six or seven dunks in a row. And just really just came around just dominating the game. It, it all comes down, the game's pretty well decided. Pembroke Hill's up seven or eight points and there's only a few seconds left. And so fortunately, um, got the steal. Sean kicked it up to me at half court. And uh, down there Fletcher's um, dad, he was sitting there talking to me because I grew up with his father a lot. And he said, I, I bet you won't um, windmill this one. <laughs> I said, all right. I said, all right, watch this. Like, it's, it's so funny, it's like talk about him, like how angry he was at the rim. And it's like his very last opportunity in Kansas City was that. And with the clock ticking down, Jerron says goodbye to Kansas City, bringing down the rim and the house. And it's like a lightning bolt, boom, his reaction, everybody's reaction. It's unbelievable. Hey man, they could have turned the lights out and the game is over. It's still one of the craziest plays I've ever seen. On any level. He ended his career at the top. I mean, I was shaking, I think, probably until I left left the gym because I was just in shock. Um, I just didn't know what was going on. So um, it was just an unbelievable feeling. We've been through the good, the bad, the ugly, the whole bit, and uh, I just, I, I, it's a real sad moment for us. And it's finally over. I mean, I can't believe it. I mean, just went by so fast. I mean, just like yesterday, it was just like I was a freshman. So, I mean, but it's time to move on.
It was almost like Jerron Rush put an exclamation point on some of the greatest years this town has ever seen. You ask anybody who was around in the 90s, and they tell you things have not been the same since. Metro Sports has moved on, newspapers are dying off, summer ball is taking over, and if we're being honest, gyms aren't quite as full as they used to be. But the question remains, can we get some of that magic back? I can't wait to find out. Do I get to be on it or not? Yeah, of course you can be. So you're creating your like Casey. Oh. So like, let's say the dudes from Missouri challenge y'all. And you're like, all right, I'm about to put my five together. My start, my top five. And I pro people talk about this all the time on Facebook. And I try not to get involved. The Metro, is that considered both sides? Without saying myself? <laughs> uh, man. Man, there's a list of guys, man, from Curtis Washington. Um. No, that's hard to say. I mean, so many. I mean, I, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, of course, Jerron was a great player. I, I will put him, I will put Warren Jabali, Warren Armstrong at, at the top of the list. Tremendous. And he was only like 6'2", 6'3". But he could start from the free throw line and fly and dunk the ball. A lot of guys probably know Wayne Simeon, Hall of Famer. Uh, Jamar Howard went to Wichita State, Bishop Meage grad. Like Michael Jefferson, for sure. Michael Jefferson? Yes, for sure. At Westport. He was a really good player. I love that Michael kid. Jefferson. Yeah, he was great, man. Um, Mike J was, uh, he was pulling up from 40 feet before Steph was doing it. There was another kid uh, by the name of uh, Marvin Fight that went to Southwest High School. He was just as, as athletic as they come. I got a, whew. KCK, don't be mad at me with this. Yeah, I gotta go with Jabo at the one. I gotta have Jabo as my point guard. Man, Jabo was a beast. NBA, NBA, uh, I'm talking about like high school. Well, I'm gonna say, right off the top, I'm gonna say Vincent. When you talk about players that just absolutely could play athleticism and do everything, you talk about Vinnie Smith, and Vinnie Smith still to this day is giving people buckets. So, Earl, Vince, and me, Jabo, Chris Chestnut, Demetrius Floyd. So six, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Derek Hood, Derek Hood, Lonzo Johnson, uh, Jerron Russ, Anthony Peeler, and Jerron Lowe. That's my five. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be honest too. Uh, like when it comes to like players, man, a lot of these people that we talk about, man, we all cool. You know what I'm saying? It's a it's a small basketball world in Kansas City. So like, um, I just think of these people being like lifelong brothers that you that you uh, that you battle against. You know, so when when you talk about Kansas City basketball, best place to play, right here. <laughs> 